A Medley of Dowsing. A BSD London Lecture, given on 21st of October 1997 by Keith Paul. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Before starting I would like to say how honored and flattered I was by the invitation to give this talk. I stand in awe of many of the earlier speakers who have presented lectures in the past and cannot claim anything like their expertise in their selected fields. I see myself more along the lines of an interested and curious experimenter, who enjoys having a go at something just to see what happens. My talk this evening is therefore entitled A Medley of Dowsing, and is offered in the hope that it may suggest a few new fields which some members might feel the urge to explore. All my life right up to retirement I have been interested in practical engineering, particularly in electronics, and I earned my crust for the last 40 years as a member of staff at the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Bedford, where I was involved in the dual fields of research and training. With this background I try to be as down-to-earth as possible in my approach to dowsing, and have little time for what I call the airy-fairy approach. My first steps in dowsing were as a small boy way back in the 1930s. Out of work during the Depression, my father had the idea of earning some money by building an incubator and hatching chickens, which he would sell to local poultry farmers. He had obtained a little pendulum, on a thin chain which he held over each egg in turn, and with this he determined its sex and condition. Like any small boy confronted by something new and interesting, I simply had to have a go, and I'm sure that you will all have guessed that it worked just as well for me, probably because, like all small children, I didn't doubt for one moment that it would. My next brush with dowsing came many years later during the war whilst I was a member of the technical staff of the BBC at the Daventry Shortwave Station, from which ten powerful senders transmitted news and other programs all over the world. As you can imagine, we were on air almost continuously throughout the 24 hours, and it was vitally important that technical hitches were few and far between. You will also no doubt realize that a 200 kW transmitter was rather bigger than your average radio set, in fact each one was housed in a series of cubicles, each about 10 foot square by about 7 foot high, and containing several rather large components. Looking for faults. The engineer in charge of the transmitter to which I was assigned was an unusual and interesting man, who did a lot to open my eyes to what we now call the paranormal, but what matters to us now is what he called his party trick. This consisted of suspending a lump of solder on a bit of string, which he would gently swing whilst with the other hand he would point towards various parts of the circuitry, and ask the question is this component about to fail? If the pendulum altered its direction, we would change that component at the next maintenance shutdown, and invariably when it was examined it would show signs of imminent failure. Once again, I had a go and found it worked for me but I still hadn't connected what we were doing with the art of dowsing. Like most of my contemporaries, I believed that diviners, if they existed at all, were odd old gentlemen who tramped around the countryside with a forked stick looking for water. I might add that I have since used this technique, of using a pendulum for fault finding many times, not only on electronic equipment but, for example, also when looking for the source of trouble on my car. Throughout my time in the army and then later whilst on the staff of the Royal Aircraft Establishment, I played about with a pendulum at various times but with no serious intent, until some 25 years ago when, together with a colleague in my laboratory, I discovered the use of angle rods and from then on I was hooked. Lest you wonder at the reactions of our scientific compatriots, I had better explain that our laboratory was situated in a fairly remote part of the Ray airfield at Bedford, and was well away from most prying eyes. During our lunch times we did all sorts of experiments which amazed us by working, but our egos were particularly boosted by an event, which we ever after called the unofficial fountain. Dowsing Adventures Back in the 70s we used to demonstrate dowsing by detecting a strong water signal in the ground alongside our lab. In fact it was over this line that I finally learned how to use the famous forked stick. Imagine our surprise one day when a working party turned up with a JCB and set about digging a hole just where we got our dowsing reaction. 
our warnings were laughed out of court. Don't be daft. You're imagining it all. The foreman said, the plans show nothing anywhere near here. And on the digger churned. Half an hour later when I went out to see what was happening there was a small circle of men including the chief engineer gazing woefully at a growing lake surrounding a vigorous little fountain. The explanation was simple. The airfield had started life during the war as an American bomber base, and when it was built the buildings on our side of the runways had been connected to the water main feeding a nearby farm, a supply not shown on later plans of the modernized research airfield. I must admit to a wonderful feeling of smugness at that moment, and if my colleague and I had had any sense we should have offered our services as dowsing consultants to the Ministry of Defense there and then. On a different tack, one of my first attempts at searching for lost objects taught me that you get what you ask for, nothing more and nothing less. My brother used to own a little weekend cottage on the banks of the River Tain in Devon. It was reached by a path over two fields, then across a footbridge over a railway line, and then along beside the track to the cottage. My wife and I were staying in the cottage for a short holiday, and on the day in question, my brother, his wife and their two children had come to visit us for the evening. They had come in two cars, my brother Aubrey from his studio in Newton Abbott, and the others a little later from the family home in Torquay. It was dark and chilly when they left so, after wrapping the smaller child in a spare anorak, we all trooped the half mile or so up to the car park, at the start of the path, then Aubrey discovered he had lost the keys to his car. The family left in the other car whilst my wife and I searched the footpath, fruitlessly with a torch, as we made our way back down to the cottage, so we decided to look more carefully the following day. The next morning my wife suggested that before we began our hunt, it wouldn't hurt if I had a go at dowsing for the missing keys, so I settled down on a garden seat overlooking the river, swung my pendulum, and tried to locate them. I visualized myself walking down the path from the car park, and asked for a reaction when I came to the keys. To my surprise and delight I got a signal from near the park itself. Very pleased, I decided to have a second check on the location, but to my disappointment I no longer found the same spot, and the reaction now came from somewhere near the gate into the second field. Confused, I tried again only to discover this time, that the location had changed again and was now much nearer the footbridge over the railway. Something was obviously drastically wrong. Learning from setbacks. By now I was thoroughly fed up and beginning to feel that dowsing was all a load of poppycock. Then round the corner of the cottage bounded my brother's two black Labradors, closely followed by Aubrey himself dangling the missing keys in his hand. He had found them in the pocket of the anorak in which he had wrapped the boy, and he had decided to call in on his way to the studio to tell us not to bother searching the path after all. Somewhat shaken I told him of my dowsing, and we realized I had actually been tracking the keys in his pocket in real time, as he walked from the car. Nowadays I would probably have first asked if there was still a need to search for the keys, but then I would have missed the thrill of discovering that I had been dowsing with high accuracy, just when I was beginning to think it wasn't working at all. One of the most unusual experiments carried out by my colleague and myself back in the mid-70s, was the deliberate laying down of mentally projected lines which were detectable by another dowser. We were beginning to suspect that there was a great deal more to the power of the human mind than we ever imagined, and nowadays it seems to me that this experiment holds the key to much more than we ever realized at the time. In essence it was a very simple technique. One of us, out of sight of the other, would select some inconspicuous landmark on the other side of the airfield, then imagine a line detectable by another dowser to be established between him and that point. He would then go back into the lab and tell his opposite number that a line had been established, whereupon the other dowser would explore on a radius of about a hundred yards around the building, until he got a reaction. We discovered that the line was only detectable to the other dowser if he knew he was specifically looking for it, and was using a search question along the lines of, I want a reaction when I come to the line laid down by Keith for me to find. I might add that even in those early days, 
we were very conscious of polluting the psychic environment, and when the experiment was concluded we always deliberately cancelled the line. I can't in all honesty claim we had a 100% success rate, if I could then Decca and all the other radio navigation firms would have gone out of business overnight, but we certainly did achieve results that were very substantially higher than pure chance would have allowed. Black Line Work Over the last few years, I have found myself much involved with black line work which is, as I am sure you all know, concerned with certain dowsable lines which can have very harmful effects on some people's well-being. When I recall those early experiments in line laying, and link with them the ideas on involuntary dowsing, expressed by Paul Meller in the September 1996 journal, it makes me wonder if some patients may unconsciously lay down their own black lines, or maybe renew them once the dowser has left the house. If, for example, the patient is one of those who have a subconscious need for the attention their affliction brings, then I think it quite possible that this is what is happening. Similarly, might not some people, on hearing or reading about black lines, decide that this must be the cause of their problem, whereupon they generate one of their own. A frightening corollary stemming from this reasoning is the possibility that, as the general public becomes more aware of the existence of noxious lines through reading such books as, are you sleeping in a safe place? Might not more black lines be created? Those early experiments led to an interest in dowsable lines, particularly those which seem to connect old churches and other sacred sites. I use the term sacred site as a general name for places in the landscape, which seem to be a focus for non-physical forces, and these include not only churches but such things as stone circles, burial mounds and standing stones. This brings us to the term ley line, which nowadays seems often to mean some kind of harmful dowsable line, so it might be a good idea if we refreshed our memories as to what a ley line really is. Ley lines were rediscovered in the 1920s by Mr. Alfred Watkins, a miller, photographer and businessman of Hereford, and in 1925 he published his findings in a book entitled, The Old Straight Track. He noticed alignments of such things as standing stones, prehistoric camps, mounds, ancient crossroads, pathways and wells across the countryside, and he suggested they marked ancient trackways. The word lay often occurred along these alignments so he, for want of a better term, called them lay lines. Sacred Sites Old churches, now counted by many as the main lay markers, did not appear in his original list of indicators, and were only included by later researchers when it was realized that most village churches, stood on earlier sacred sites. In recent years it has been discovered that some Watkins type lays have a dowsable element, and also that there are many dowsable lines which are not physically marked in any way, unfortunately this has led to the misuse of the term ley line, as a blanket name for any kind of dowsable line, regardless of whether it conforms to the Watkins criteria or not. For this reason I always use the term dowsable line, or dowsable effect, when working with these alignments. When researching these dowsable lines I identify them by means of color, and for this I have developed a modified form of the mega disk which for convenience I call a mega square. This came about because I found that very frequently, I encounter at sacred sites a type of line which responds to the color orange, and it is easier to make up a square color plate for nine colors than it is to make a round one. Nowadays my wife June has become a proficient dowser and helps me in all my experiments, so as an example of our work on sacred lines, may I tell you about our exploration of some lines we located on the Isles of Scilly. We based our survey on the standing stones situated above Porth Mellon on St. Mary's, from which we found three lines, each heading either for another sacred site or in a significant direction, namely the midwinter and midsummer sunrises. No less than three lines from other places in the islands converge on a very significant standing stone called, the Old Nan of Gew, the stone which intrigued the late Donovan Wilkins so much, as those who saw his excellent television programs will remember. At the beginning of this talk I pointed out that I try to be as objective as possible in my dowsing, and my real reason for talking about these lines on the Isles of Scilly is to explain my technique in this kind of research. 
Before going on site I don't doodle on the map looking for any alignments, in fact if possible, I leave the map at home and record my findings in a notebook. I first douse around the stone, or whatever, at a radius of several yards, and stick a marker in the ground where I get a reaction. Once the markers are in place, I take accurate bearings over them, and record these together with the colors which react to them. Only at the end of the day do I convert the magnetic bearings to true and plot them on the map. If I then find that the lines head for significant targets, I can be reasonably sure that they are genuine, and not the result of wishful thinking which is, as you all know, one of the greatest enemies of good dowsing. Not all sacred sites need be large or ancient for them to be connected by dowsable lines, as I discovered one day whilst doing a routine check on an old Victorian house occupied by an elderly and very devout couple. I found nothing harmful, but in their lounge I detected a very strong purple and white line, colors which I have come to associate with spirituality and healing. I could see no reason for this line, but from where my wife was sitting, she could see on the high mantelpiece above the fireplace a group of figurines depicting the crucifixion. The line ran from here diagonally across the room, passing through the old gentleman's favorite chair and on into the wall behind it. When I asked what was behind the wall the old chap, now very excited, took me out into the hall, down a passage, and from thence into the kitchen. There on a shelf on the other side of the lounge wall stood another Calvary group, and it was there that the purple and white line terminated. Now here were two groups of relatively new plaster, or even plastic objects, not embedded in the ground, not over intersecting underground streams and not visited by many people, yet they were behaving in the manner I had come to associate with ancient holy sites. I can only assume that the love and devotion, which this deeply religious couple had focused on them over the years, had charged them in some manner and, even more amazingly, had got the two sites talking to each other with the purple and white lines. And was it another case of involuntary dowsing which had prompted the old gentleman to put his chair squarely on the line, even though this was not where one might reasonably expect it to be situated in such a room? Dowsing in time. Still on the subject of lines but of rather a different type comes another experiment which I carried out a couple of years ago. It is, I think of interest because it also involves what I would call dowsing in time. One of my many interests lies in the great square-rigged sailing ships, which carried grain from Australia to Europe between the wars, and in particular the Hetzig in Sicily, considered by many the most beautiful of her type. She ran aground on the South Devon coast over sixty years ago, and I still clearly remember being taken out the following day to see her lying forlornly on the rocks just west of Bolt Head. Since her stranding at 3.55 in the morning of the 25th of April 1936, there has been much speculation as to exactly why such a world-famous four-masted bark, three times winner of the so-called Grain Race and flagship of the Gustav Eriksson line, should have been wrecked only eight hours after calling at Falmouth for orders. There had been a light fog that night, but according to the entries in her logbook, she should have been at least 10 miles south of Prawl Point at the time she struck the hamstone. Why not have a go at dowsing her course that night? I asked myself and here you see the result of that dowse on a modern chart. Using map dowsing techniques and asking the question, please indicate when my pendulum crosses the course sailed by the Herzog in Sicily, during her last passage up channel to the hamstone from Falmouth, I was able to plot a course. Although she made several course alterations during the night, allowing for the tidal stream, leeway, etc., and for the way orders were given on sailing ships, the shape of the dow's course tallies exactly with that given in the ship's logbook, except for the very first course, set out of Falmouth which differs from that claimed by 30 degrees. This error is consistent with a correction known as magnetic variation having been applied in the wrong direction when leaving Falmouth, and would have resulted in her hitting the hamstone after sailing 49 nautical miles. Without turning this talk into a treatise on navigation, I will simply say this is an error easily made on the compasses used by those elderly sailing ships built before the First World War and that my doused course must be extremely close to the only course the ship could have sailed that night to go aground at that spot. 
I must admit that it gave me a great thrill, to discover that even such a transient thing as the course of a ship through the water over half a century earlier could be discovered by dowsing. It makes me even more sure that the human mind has almost unbelievable powers if we learn to use them correctly. Tunnels at Bletchley Park The next experiment I shall describe is rather more in the mainstream of dowsing, although this particular example has a certain glamour about it, in view of the fact that it took place at Bletchley Park, which was, during the war and for long after, probably the most secret place in Britain. As you all no doubt know, it was here that the German and Japanese military codes were broken, in effect allowing us to look over the shoulders of the enemy general staff as they penned their orders. After the war Bletchley Park continued in government hands until not many years ago, but nowadays. Most of its secrets have been revealed, and it is open to the public at weekends. My Dow had nothing to do with codes and was concerned with the hunt for a secret tunnel, which was believed by some to have once existed between Bletchley Railway Station and somewhere within the grounds of the park. There were persistent stories that Churchill often came to Bletchley by train and was seen to enter an air raid shelter in the goods sidings, but was never seen to leave it again. Since 1945 both Bletchley Park and the station have undergone much rebuilding, and there is now no trace of either end of this. Tunnel, so a couple of years ago I was invited to see if I could locate it. So, one cold winter afternoon I set off with my Y rod in the company of half a dozen or so Bletchley researchers, and started to hunt. I soon got a reaction near the big house itself and began a series of traverses, with my companions noting my results on their map. The buildings are very haphazardly arranged, and as the tunnel seemed to go under one block, we had to take a long detour around it to pick up the line again. Still holding the rod in the search position as we walked around the detour, just in case the suspected tunnel made a dog leg under the building, I was quite surprised when it suddenly gave a reaction. A look of sheer amazement appeared on the faces of my companions, and I was excitedly hustled into the entrance of the building where they pointed to a hole which led under the road. It was only a short tunnel connecting two buildings, but to us it was a very important one, in that not only did it prove to my companions that dowsing for tunnels really worked, it also reassured me that my technique was correct and that the main tunnel I was tracking also probably existed. I lost the main tunnel line just beyond a small building which didn't seem to fit in with the rest of the others, but a spur seemed to go off in a new direction and ended at a blank wall. We did not have a key to this building, but my companions told me that just the other side of the wall, there was a small room with a hole in the floor into which it appeared several tons of rubble had been dumped, and was for some unknown reason often referred to as Churchill's toilet. There also seemed to be a tunnel under the lake which puzzled me very much, particularly as my companions had no knowledge of what it might be. There is however a fascinating sequel to the story. The 50th anniversary of the V-Day celebrations occurred a few months after my douse, and on this day several of the 7,000 people who had worked at Bletchley Park during the war returned on a nostalgic visit. Due to the secrecy surrounding the work, staff were discouraged from paying any attention to their environment, so many had no idea where it was they actually worked. However, one lady told researchers that on getting off the bus which brought them in, she would go down some steps, then along a corridor and into the suite of offices where she worked. You can imagine how interested my friends were when she went on to say that the rooms had no windows, and that there was a strong rumor among the girls in her department, that if ever they were hit by a bomb they would all be drowned. As far as I know there has been no attempt to open up any of these tunnels, and anyway they are probably far too unsafe after so long, but I must admit I would like to know for sure if I was right in my dowsing. Delving into crop circles. Round about 1990 I became interested in dowsing at various crop circles and pictograms which were then appearing in the south of England. Let me say here and now that I have no idea if they are made by aliens, earth forces, atmospheric disturbances or even by psychokinesis. Obviously many of them are hoaxes, 
but I have little faith in the theory that two elderly characters called Doug and Dave, constructed all of them with the aid of a plank, a rope and a baseball hat with a bit of wire on its peak. Regardless of how they were made in the first place, many of them exhibit very strong dowsable effects. There have also been reports of many unusual happenings in some of them, ranging from healing and various psychic experiences, through to the unaccountable failure of electronic equipment. I myself experienced one of a pair of fairly new camera batteries go completely flat whilst the other remained almost fully charged, in the course of photographing a complex and beautiful pictogram which appeared at Bythorn, Cambridgeshire, in August 1993. This 180-foot pictogram consisted of a ring of ten crown-shaped segments, around its perimeter enclosing a pentagram, and three concentric rings all marked out in perfectly laid pathways in the wheat in the manner of a mandala. The dowsable effects in this formation reminded me very much of the magnetic fields, set up between the stator and rotor of an electric motor, except that there were three colors indicated on my mega square, not just two. Using the traditional ideas of positive and negative, I found a most unusual effect in the areas at the points of the pentagram, which indicated green on my square. Here both polarities were present at the same time, and it raises the question of what I call static, and dynamic zero. Imagine for a moment a tug-of-war rope simply laying on the ground. The knotted handkerchief at its center remains stationary, and I think we would all agree that it represents a static zero force in the rope. Now imagine two hefty rugby teams pick up the rope and start to heave on it, but they are exactly equal in power. To the casual observer the handkerchief is still stationary, and this would imply that the condition is unchanged, but you and I both know there is a latent force of several tons now in that rope, a condition which I describe as dynamic zero. Bearing this in mind for a moment, I wonder how many times we dowsers working in the earth energy field have come across a site where there were two effects in perfect opposition, and we have been unable to spot it against the background of genuine inactivity. Perhaps we had better have not only yin and yang but yang to represent the dynamic zero. Alton Barnes Message Still on the subject of crop circles, Perhaps I could do no better than to close with a description of the experiment connected with the famous Alton Barnes pictogram of 1990 which gave rise to the article A Message from the Mind Within Nature printed in the September 1992 edition of the journal. This formation, the first of the really big spectacular pictograms, appeared overnight, and for size, complexity and the perfection of its construction is still in my estimation one of the most memorable. Shortly after its appearance, my wife and I drove down to Dow's in it, an experience which we can only describe as awesome. An odd side effect we experienced was that we seemed to be outside time while we were dowsing there and, although we were in the formation for more than three hours according to the car clock, it seemed to us both that it could not have been more than a quick ten minutes at the most. Some months later, purely out of curiosity, Four of us set up a question and answer session working with a piece of stone collected from the pictogram. We soon discovered that at least one object of the formation was to relay a message and that the crux of this message could be found in the traditions and beliefs of many cultures on this earth. It did not take long to discover that the message could be found in our own traditions including the Bible. We dug out the family Bible and, to protect ourselves from subliminal clues, we decided to work through lists of numbers which could then be related to book, chapter and verse rather than actually scanning the pages. I would like to mention here that I am not a great reader of the Bible so there could be no chance of my subconscious having any influence. Our dowsing led to Chronicles 2, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, and I must admit that the hair on the back of my neck stood up as I read the relevant passage. There, sandwiched between verses describing the building of the temple and completely out of context with its neighbors I read. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their wicked sin and will heal their land. 
Remember that 1990 was the start of the long drought period we have had this last few years, so such a message had particular significance at that time. It doesn't matter what belief system that you follow, neither does it matter if you believe the circles were created by Doug and Dave, or little green men from Mars, the message it conveys is very relevant today. To my mind it is a very clear warning from what I call the mind within nature, that we continue to destroy our environment at our peril. I can think of no other experiment in dowsing, which I could describe tonight, that could possibly follow this, so I will simply close my presentation by expressing the hope that perhaps something I have described, might set someone off on a new and exciting line of discovery. The End